Ja, wunderbar. Die Transition-Bewegung lebt in Deutschland. Wunderbar, freut uns. Ganz, ganz herzlich willkommen. Ich möchte Sie herzlich begrüßen. Ich bin Barbara Unmüßig, Vorstand in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Ich möchte Sie begrüßen, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde der Bewegung, der Transitionsbewegung. Ich möchte Sie, meine Damen und Herren, begrüßen, lieber Rob Hopkins, liebe Renate. Herzlich willkommen zu unserer Green Lecture mit Rob Hopkins, Transition, ein Modell für eine zukunftsfähige Lebensweise. Sie alle sind heute zum ersten Mal Gast bei einem neuen Format der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Es heißt Green Lectures. Was meinen wir damit? Was wollen wir mit Green Lectures? Die Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung versteht sich als Ort, an dem neue gesellschaftspolitische Ideen und emanzipatorische Projekte entwickelt, vorgestellt und diskutiert werden, gerade auch und ab und an jenseits der Tagespolitik. Wir wollen aber eben auch gerade mit denjenigen, die in der Tagespolitik stecken, diese neuen Ideen, diese wunderbaren, auch innovativen Projekte besprechen. Und deswegen freue ich mich heute Abend, dass Renate Kühner sich, die in der Realpolitik steckt, die in der Tagespolitik steckt. Nein, reale Politik machst du. Das war damit gemeint. Keine strömungspolitische Aus Aussage. Ich ähm, freue mich wirklich sehr, dass du da bist. Wir als Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung unterstützen weltweit soziale Innovationen und Suchprozesse für ein besseres Leben. Leider ist unsere Publikation zum Konzept des When We Wir vergriffen. Auch das ist ja ein Konzept aus dem Andin Lateinamerika, was sich mit genau der Diskussion beschäftigt, wie können wir eigentlich bei allen Krisen trotzdem die Vision und die Idee für ein besseres Leben für uns alle entwickeln. Und wir, das deutete sich ja schon an mit When We Wir, wir sind als internationale Stiftung natürlich auch bestens dafür prädestiniert, an Ausschau in anderen Ländern zu halten. Was bewegt Menschen dort? Und wie denken in anderen Ländern Menschen über Gerechtigkeit, ganz unterschiedlicher Provenienz, der sozialen, der Geschlechtergerechtigkeit, der intragenerationellen Gerechtigkeit nach? Und uns interessiert natürlich vor allem, was gibt es für Konzepte zur Zukunftsfähigkeit trotz aller Krisen? Mit Green Lectures werden wir deshalb in unregelmäßigen Abständen internationale Denkerinnen und Denker, Aktivistinnen und Aktivisten zu uns in die Heinrich-Boll-Stiftung einladen, um eben genau aus anderen Ländern gesellschaftspolitische Diskurse äh, zu verstehen und Visionäres besser kennenzulernen. Ich glaube, wir haben hier in Deutschland nicht genug davon, uns auch von anderen Menschen aus anderen Kontinenten für diese Such- und Denkprozesse bereichern zu lassen. Ich bin sehr davon überzeugt, dass wir jeden mehr, mehr denn je Denk- und Diskursräume brauchen, dass wir Pionierinnen brauchen, die Neues ausprobieren für die Gestaltung der Zukunft. Und ich bin sehr davon überzeugt, dass der Blick über den nationalen Tellerrand mehr als angebracht ist, weil ich erlebe, dass wir uns zum Teil immer mehr bei aller Globalisierung in nationale und in Renationalisierungsprozesse einigeln und viel zu wenig schauen, auch wenn uns das Internet verführt und wir uns alle für international halten, was eigentlich sonst wo passiert. Wir sind deshalb sehr, sehr glücklich und auch ein bisschen stolz, dass wir für den heutigen Abend Rob Hopkins haben gewinnen können, den Begründer des Transition Movements, und er heute Abend zum ersten Mal in Berlin spricht. Und es ist überhaupt sein zweiter Auftritt in Deutschland, überhaupt, nachdem er gestern Abend schon, hat er gerade erzählt, in Bonn vor knapp 300 Leuten von seinen Ideen hat erzählen können. Ich nehme an, dass viele von Ihnen, und ich würde sogar behaupten, die meisten von Ihnen, Teil der Transition-Bewegung sind. Aber für diejenigen, die sich noch anstecken lassen wollen, hier eine kleine Erklärung. Und ich hoffe, ich treffe das auch, weil Sie sollen es ja gleich erklären. In der Transition-Bewegung arbeiten Initiativen in vielen Städten und Gemeinden daran, einen Übergang in eine postfossile und vor allem auch lokalere Wirtschaft zu schaffen. Die 
Bewegung wirbt mit der Idee des einfachen, des genügsamen Lebens, aufbauend auf wirtschaftlichen Kreisläufen, auf wirtschaftlicher Selbstversorgung und auf der Grundlage von Permakultur, über die wir ja gleich mehr von äh, Rob Hopkins erfahren werden, darüber, was sie meint und äh, was sie ist. Und ich verspreche mir von seinem Vortrag, dass er uns auch erläutern wird, ob dieses Konzept anwendbar ist im globalen Maßstab für viele Milliarden Menschen, äh, ob dieses Konzept überhaupt funktionieren kann. Ich denke, das wird uns auch in der Diskussion später bewegen. Erlauben Sie mir hier ein paar Anmerkungen und Bemerkungen zur Biografie von Rob Hopkins. Er ist Mitgründer der Transition-Bewegung. Er lebt in der Stadt Totnes in der englischen Grafschaft Devon, wo er 2005 die erste offizielle Transition Town mitbegründet hat. Das Transition-Konzept hat er in den Jahren zuvor während seiner Lehrtätigkeit im Bereich Permakultur am irischen Kingsale Further Education College entwickelt. Und zusammen mit seinen Studentinnen und Studenten hat er dabei einen Plan zur Reduktion des Energieverbrauchs für die Stadt Kinsale erarbeitet. Rob Hopkins hat an der Universität Plymouth promoviert und seine Dissertation zu Peak-Oil-Szenarien und zu Energiereduktionspfaden auf lokaler Ebene am Beispiel der Stadt Totnes geschrieben. Er ist Autor, das kennen Sie, nehme ich an, der Bücher »The Transition Handbook«, auf Deutsch »Das Energiewendehandbuch« und der Publikation The Transition Companion, das im vergangenen Jahr erschienen ist. Die britische Zeitung The Independent zählte Rob Hopkins 2009 zu den 100 wichtigsten Umweltaktivisten und 2012 war er auf der Liste der britischen 50 New Radicals. And I would like to, and I would like to learn what is a new radical. Im Dezember, ich glaube, das ist auch eine tolle Nachricht äh, und ein Glückwunsch und eine große Anerkennung, wurde das Transition Network vom Europäischen Wirtschafts- und Sozialausschuss mit dem Civil Society Preis ausgezeichnet. Once again, Rob, warm welcome. Minutes. Ich möchte Ihnen auch Renate Künast vorstellen und Sie herzlich willkommen heißen. Ich sagte ja schon, ich freue mich wirklich sehr, dass du hier bist. Sie ist Fraktionsvorsitzende von Bündnis 90 Die Grünen im Deutschen Bundestag und wie vielleicht auch die meisten von Ihnen hoffentlich noch wissen, von 2001 bis 2005 Bundesministerin für Verbraucherschutz, Ernährung und Landwirtschaft der rot-grünen Bundesregierung. Seit 2005, ich sagte es schon, Fraktionsvorsitzende der Grünen im Bundestag. Ich denke, dass Renate vor allem auch mit ihrer Erfahrung als Landwirtschaftsministerin, Verbraucherministerin äh, und mit ihren gesamten politischen Erfahrungen dann nach dem Vortrag und im Gespräch mit Rob Hopkins sicherlich sehr viel von ihren politischen Erfahrungen einbringen kann. Und es wird, ich vermute, ja auch sehr darum gehen, wie politisch um- und durchsetzbar ist eigentlich, sind eigentlich die Konzepte, die die Transition-Bewegung vorlegt und lebt. Wir, ganz kurz zum Ablauf. Wir werden bis ungefähr Viertel vor neun diskutieren. Erst gibt es den Vortrag von Rob Hopkins. Dann wird Renate Künast auf ihn erstmal mit Kommentaren und äh, Meinungseinschätzungen äh, reagieren. Danach gibt es hier auf dem Podium eine kurze Diskussion, dann wollen wir natürlich mit Ihnen diskutieren. Dann ist Viertel vor neun eine kurze Pause, da können Sie sich stärken mit Brezeln und äh, was zu trinken. Und ab 29 Uhr, so unser Plan, wollen wir den... Äh, no, 21, was habe ich gesagt? Ach super, ja, mein Tag hat 29 Stunden. Ähm, um 21 Uhr dann den Dokumentarfilm Voices of Transition mit, äh, von Nils Aguilar ähm, hier zeigen. Der Film zeigt, und ich möchte Sie wirklich bitten, sich diesen Film auch anzuschauen und hier zu bleiben, wie verschiedene Akteure der agrarökologischen Wende das 
Transition-Konzept bereits leben. Rob Hopkins ist einer der Protagonisten im Film. Der Film hatte im vergangenen Jahr Premiere und wird Ende April auf Tournee in deutschen Kinos gehen, auch unterstützt von uns, der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Der Regisseur, wo ist er denn eigentlich? Ich habe ihn immer noch nicht... Ah, da, alles klar. Nils Aguilar wird später für Fragen zur Verfügung stehen. Ich möchte vor allem Nils Aguilar ganz, ganz herzlich für die tolle Zusammenarbeit danken. Sie sind es, die uns auch den Zugang und den Kontakt mit Rob Hopkins äh, verschafft haben und ihn hergestellt haben. Und ich möchte hier auch äh, besonders herzlich begrüßen Gerd Wessling, der Koordinator der Transitionsinitiativen in Deutschland, Österreich und Herr Schweiz. Danke für die tolle Zusammenarbeit und ich hoffe, sie geht weiter. Ich möchte hier jetzt nur noch ganz kurz für Green Lecture am 11. Juni werben. Nächster Termin hier in diesem Format. Auch da werden wir, wie ich finde, einen wunderbaren Gast haben, Michael Clare. Er ist Professor für Friedens- und Weltsicherheitsstudien und Autor des Buches »The Race for What's Left – The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources«. Merken Sie sich den 11. Juni und ich würde mich überhaupt freuen, wenn Sie bei Green Lectures immer elektrisiert sind und sagen, super, da gibt es ein tolles Angebot zur Debatte, zum Austausch, zum Vernetzen von der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. So, und jetzt bin ich still und freue mich auf Rob Hopkins. Dankeschön. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, Michael Clare, that's fantastic. He's brilliant. Go and see Michael Clare. He's fantastic. Thank you for supporting my advertising. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, will, it, will something appear on here? Fantastic. Um, well, thank you all for coming. And it's fantastic to see so many young people out here tonight as well. That's really, really fantastic. Um, so, well, and, and everybody else, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Go, you can't win, can you? Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, transition and give a sense of what the idea is all about and where it comes from and a sense of what people are doing. Because I think as a lot of what my role is is really just telling the stories of what people are doing. I think transition is an, is an experiment is a huge self-organizing experiment. And so I want to sort of share some of those learnings with you, I suppose. So I'm going to start with this. This is a sort of a, a me doodling on top of a, of a proper graph. And really, I want, it's to make the point that we are currently sitting on the top of a really important transition in history. So we are coming to the end of the age of cheap energy and all that that has made possible. And you will be reading a lot of stuff in the media now of people saying, oh, there's a new age of oil out there, a oil and gas. There's all this uh, tar sands and, uh, and shale oil and shale gas and there's masses left and you know, we have a new golden age of oil. The point I want to make is that the two halves of the oil age, in England we have an expression about a football, that, a football match that it's a game of two halves. And the oil age is a game of two halves in the same way. The first half has been about cheap, easy to access uh, oil. So, uh, but the second half is completely different. The second half, there is still lots and lots of fossil fuels, but it's much, much harder to find. It's much in much more remote locations. It requires a lot more energy to extract it. The carbon implications are appalling. And Bill McKibben, uh, who some of you may know from his work campaigning on climate change in the US, and Dr. James Hansen from NASA, say that if that's the, the total fossil fuel reserves that we know remain, we can only burn one-fifth of what we know remains in order to avoid two degrees of, 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 of climate change. 
So where, what we decide to do now as we stand on top of this energy mountain uh, is momentously important. And so what I want to really offer you in, in transition is, is one approach to, to where we go from here. This is the only thing that is vaguely like a graph that I will be showing you tonight. This is out of a really important report produced by a FTSE 250 company uh, in the UK recently where they say actually peak oil, sometimes people imagine it means we're about to run out of, of oil. Actually, what it means is it's, is it's the moment when the amount of energy you put in to get energy back out again starts to become really difficult. In the 1930s in Saudi Arabia, you put one unit of energy in, you got 100 units of energy out, an extraordinary energy return for, for a civilization. By the 1990s, that had fallen to about 40 to 1. Now oil production is down around 17 to 1. But many of the things that we are being told are our energy future in the fossil fuel world are down here. The tar sands, uh, shale gas are down at sort of 2, 3, 4 to 1. And what he argues in this report is that actually it's not the moment when you run out of oil that matters. It's the moment when you have to put uh, uh, so much energy back into getting back energy back out again that it just doesn't work. If you're a fox and you eat rabbits and you spend all day running around trying to catch rabbits and you don't catch any, you won't be a fox for very long. <laughs> you put more energy in than you get out again. This is really, really important. So these new oils, the, these new energy sources that are being touted uh, are not appropriate to sustain a kind of consumer energy-hungry society in the way that we have it. So in transition, we say there is no cavalry coming riding to our rescue. When you look at these issues of, of, of uh, the end of the age of cheap energy, uh, the, the end of really thinking that we can operate without climate change being, a, being, be, being an issue, and also the end of the age of cheap debt, cheap credit, that kind of thing, actually where we, when we look at in the communities where we live, who's coming riding to the rescue? It's us. We are that cavalry. And transition is really a response that says it falls to us in the places that we live to make this happen. Of course, we also need national government. We need local government. We need business. We need international things like we should have had in Copenhagen and Doha. But the piece in the middle, you know, there are all these books, 365 things you can do to save the planet, the things you can do on your own, and then the things government can do. Transition is about that bit in the middle. What if I get together with the people on my street, people on my neighborhood? What can we do? What's the power that lies in there that, that can drive that forward? So two ideas that are central to transition. Firstly, this idea of localization, of shortening the distances over which we do things. I said yesterday in the talk I gave in Bonn that every year the UK exports one and a half million kilos of potatoes to Germany and at the same time imports 150 million kilos of potatoes from Germany, which is just ridiculous. And a guy said, well, we have better potatoes. <laughs> I don't know, we can debate that one into the night, I suspect. <laughs> You know, but actually, a huge amount of stuff travels around the world just to make GDP look better. Really. And actually, uh, so the idea of whether we can look at import substitution, as you reach the end of the age of cheap energy, globalization as we've known it becomes increasingly difficult. And of course, there are issues around how we build resilience in the developed world alongside how we're building resilience in the, in the developing world. But this principle of localization is, is really important. And the idea of resilience about how do we design into the places where we live, into our economies, the ability to withstand shock from the outside is a really, really important idea, I think. So in transition, we'll talk about the, the economies of the places where we live as being like a bucket. And into that bucket comes money from government and grants and wages and pensions. And at the moment, most of it pours out through the holes, through supermarkets, through uh, internet shopping, through paying our energy bills. That money is gone. And its ability to stay and make things happen uh, is lost and has disappeared. We would argue... Every one of those holes in that bucket is a potential local business, a potential local livelihood. And that actually, if we're looking around, scrabbling around now for the big new economic idea for the next 20, 40, 50 years, I would argue that this is, this is it. This idea that we do things differently in that sense. So transition is an experiment, as I said. It started uh, in Ireland, uh, took off in Devon, is now in thousands of initiatives. We know of at least two and a half thousand, but there are many more that we know of who haven't told us what they're doing. Uh, it's a self-organizing model. People pick it up wherever they are and they make it happen. Uh, and this is happening now in 40 countries. 
And uh, the whole thing has, has, is like a virus. It goes off and it runs and it spreads and, uh, and, and it always surprises you. We got a phone call the other day from people starting transition Ulan Bator. Uh, I had to sit down for a little while after that. You know, it's, it's really exciting. And what transition has emerged as is, is like we, we, we talk about it like this. It's like a larder. It's like a pantry in your house. There are different ingredients that we see that people have done uh, and then in every place you select those ingredients and you assemble them in different ways. There is no right way to do it. And what I want to share with you is some of those ingredients and tell you about them using some stories about what people are doing and the different stages. So there's maybe five stages to how this process goes. The first one, rather unimaginatively, we call starting out. So it starts with a group of people who come together. Some of you may be, how many people here are part of a, a, a transition group where you live? Okay. Very good. No, no. Maybe a few more by the end of this evening, we hope. That'd be good. So it starts with some people who come together who are excited about the idea. And, uh, and one of the things that's really important, I think, is that, that, is, is that the groups uh, have the right tools to know that that group is going to last. You know, you don't want to get six months into running the group and then you take each other to court for slander or something. So actually giving people the tools for how those groups work is really important. And that's one of the, that's one of the things in the trainings and so on that we do that gives them a real chance of success. Uh, then they do a lot of awareness raising, try and talk about these ideas around peak oil, climate change, resilience, tell the stories of what's happening in other places, this kind of thing. A lot of that work goes on. These are Bertie and Gertie, who are from uh, Transition Town Tooting in London. And the big aware, they came to us and said, how do we do transition in Tooting? I said, I have absolutely no idea. But when you know, do come and tell us. So they went and they designed an enormous street carnival with a thousand uh, kids from local schools and mosques and temples who made incredible puppets and six metre high animated figures and everything was made out of recycled materials. Uh, they used a million old plastic bags and old crisp packets uh, and uh, with a week to go the local uh, council said uh, you can't do it. You, you can't march down the main road. It's not allowed. Uh, if you're going to do it, you have to pay the policing. It'll cost you £50,000. They said, well, we haven't got £50,000. So they went to see the local police, and the head of the local police said, we'll pay for the policing because this is the best bit of community uh, development we've seen happen here for years. And in the end, it went ahead. 1,000 people, 10,000 people came out to see it. At the end, local restaurants fed everybody for free in the local park. Uh, and Bertie and Gertie are, are, are models of the real Bertie and Gertie who swim on the local swimming baths uh, every, uh, every day. Personal resilience is really important. This idea that actually uh, those, I'm sure there are many people here who've spent a long time working in, in environmental activism and all too often the model, and I speak, I speak from my own experience, all too often the model of environmental activism is a sort of uh, like carrying a boulder up a hill, you know, and, and you're kind of keeping going and, and, and uh, uh, I must keep going for the sake of the planet, you know, and not sort of really honouring the fact that it's really hard work and lots of people suffer from burnout and suffer from exhaustion exhaustion and so designing into this process a way that people can be supported and can help each other is really important from the start and having a vision a story about where this is where we're going to go what could it look like what would Berlin look like in 2030 if we get this right how would it be you know if we can't tell that story if we can't see it and smell it and, and, and hear it then how are we going to really make that happen this is in Toronto Transition Toronto did a big uh, theatre piece a kind of interactive theatre piece about trying to dream that alive, bring that to life with, with actors and props and people in a very creative kind of a way. So that's the first stage where you come together and you think, well, let's do this. And so by now, maybe you might be called transition wherever you are. You have a group. You feel like you're working well. So then the second stage is about how do you, how do you take that a bit deeper? Oh, and that picture's disappeared. Oh, sorry. Get, oh, no, hang on. That's very strange. Okay, here we are. So this is uh, in Bielefeld. This is the permaculture garden that, that Transition Town Bielefeld have set up. And this is about volunteers. So at the beginning, doing transition, there's not really any money in it. It's driven by volunteers. Nobody really tends to get paid. Uh, so this has been a fantastic project for all kinds of very, very diverse people coming together to put their time and energy into making something happen, something physical happen. And how you, how you support volunteers in doing that kind of project is really important. If you want to know any more about it, Gert can tell you about it later. 
Sometimes that doesn't. Sometimes there's a different model that, that happens because actually uh, uh, it takes a lot of work, and a lot of us are very, very busy. This is in Sarasota in the States, and transition Sarasota. The guy second from that side on the bottom row, the guy with the checked shirt, uh, uh, he designed transition Sarasota in such a way that it would actually employ him uh, to run it. Uh, and so the idea of starting to think about a transition initiative as an enterprise, which is able to create livelihoods for people from the beginning, is a really interesting part of this experiment, you know, looking at seeing how that works. And around this time, groups start to do things as well. It's not a kind of an academic think tank. It's about people getting on with it and doing stuff. This is in uh, Seattle in, in the US, and Transition Seattle started a tool library where they've had over 1,200 tools donated by local people, from chisels to big sort of saws and all kinds of equipment, and you pay $40 a year to become a member, and then you can rent out any tools like you would from a library. And this is the local newspaper. Have a guy who draws sketches for them, who came out and uh, and took some and did some drawings of what they're doing. And this is in Portugal, in Porto Alegre, in, in Portugal, which, like much of Portugal, has been really affected by the, uh, the economic crisis over the last couple of years. And just off the shot here, about, about where we are, there's a big apartment block. And the woman who I spoke to who lives in this apartment block, she said, over the last 15 years, I've, I've watched the people who live in this block turn their backs on each other slowly. The social uh, cohesion has kind of started to, to has, has really faded away. And then up on, the, on the other side of there, out the other side of the picture, is a, big, is a shopping mall, a shopping center. And this was just grass. And then one of the people in, uh, in Tran- Porto Alegre en Transition, however you say that, Transitao, uh, said, uh, su- su- suggested the idea of, um, of creating a garden on here. Clearly, this is not going to feed Porto Alegre. But actually, what happened was, everybody who lived in the apartment block came out and got involved in this garden. This garden acted as a catalyst for all kinds of other things. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't take much. It takes a small focal thing to stimulate that kind of sense of possibility of what we could create from here. This garden grew all kinds of different things and it's become a real kind of catalyst for, for, for transition in the, in, the, in the town. And local food is often where people get started. Local, you don't need to wait for permission from anyone to start doing local food. This is uh, in Tooting again and when we talk about local food, in some rural towns, you can kind of imagine what local food means, local seasonal food. If you go to Tooting, which is a very, very diverse part of London, most of the food shops on the high street, uh, all the food is imported from the Indian subcontinent, every single thing in the shop. What does local food mean in that context? So they run a festival every year called the Foodival, where people bring things that they've grown on their allotments, in their back gardens, in community gardens around Tooting, and they bring them down to the high street in Tooting, and then the cooks from each tradition, the Turkish cooks, the Lebanese cooks, the Indian, Pakistani, whatever, cook that food in that tradition and give it away on the high street, accompanied by various other events too. So by this stage, you're up and running, you've got projects going. People are starting to look and say, yeah, this transition group are doing something. There's a, there's a buzz that's starting to be created. So how do you then start to really connect that more widely out into the community and what's going on there? This is one of the groups in London again. Uh, the idea of using open space, these kind of tools for bringing people together to have big community brainstorms about where we go from here, what can the future be like. And if you're a control freak, organising these events is absolutely terrifying <laughs> because they are about self-organisation and you think it's not going to work and they always work. It's really an ex- extraordinary thing to be around. And it's around this time that often transition groups start to talk to their local council because if you go very early and you haven't done anything then the response might leave you feeling a bit deflated. But actually, if you go later on when you have things behind you, it can make a big difference. This is uh, in Italy, in a place called Montevello, which is near Bologna. And uh, the transition group started up there, and it was going very well. And then the local elections were coming up. So two of the people from the local transition group ran uh, for for the local government, and they both got elected. So now the guy with the sash, he is the local mayor. And the guy too along from him with the, with the little beard, he's the environment minister. And they produced the most extraordinary uh, statement, resolution, when they, when, when they got in, which talked about resilience and sustainability, and it even talked about promoting a culture of frugality and simplicity. I haven't yet to see any other local authority that talks about those uh, virtues. So the fourth stage, I think, is where transition really uh, uh, becomes 
something uh, really, really exciting, which is we call building, which is where we look at the need for a new local economy and, and, and uh, where the new economy is going to come from, and we say, well, we need to do it. We need to be the catalyst for that. We need to start this. This is one of the projects that we've done in Totnes, which is called Transition Streets, and I understand there are moves afoot to try and develop a German version of Transition Streets. This won a, a very prestigious uh, award in the UK a couple of years ago. The idea is if you want to make people help people to reduce their energy consumption and so on, maybe the best way to do it is just by getting people together on their streets rather than the government sending people leaflets and that kind of thing. So the idea is we've produced a very simple workbook And people get groups of between six and ten of their neighbours together. They meet in each other's houses. First week they maybe look at energy and learn how the energy works in their house and how much energy they use. Second week they look at water. Third week they look at food and so on. And on average, by the end of the whole thing, they've reduced their carbon footprint by about 1.2, 1.3 tonnes. Save themselves maybe 800 euros or something. And 700 households now in our town have done this, of which more than half were, were low-income households. But the really exciting thing about it for me is when I meet people in the street who've done this, they don't say, do you know what, Rob? I've just saved 1.2 tonnes of carbon. It's fantastic. I feel fa fabulous. What they say is this. I know my neighbours. This is from a, when we asked most of them at the end, what did you get out of it? This is what they said. I, know, I get to know, getting to know my neighbours, community, feeling part of the place where I live. And it's really interesting that, you, that you, maybe you, you, you tackle climate change through a different way, by bringing people closer together and by, bringing, by, by building community. And uh, what's happened, a lot of these groups enjoyed meeting with each other so much that when they'd finished the programme, they just carried on meeting anyway. And some of them have set up a community cinema. Some of them set up an orchard. You know, these kind of things uh, move out from this. And how do we start to create a, a new economy that actually starts to create work for people? Not just a kind of a, a sort of a gift economy, kind of virtual thing, but how do we make tangible, viable enterprises that are creating work? This is in a place called Slathwaite in Yorkshire. Their local greengrocer shut down, so the community raised £20,000 and took over the shop as a community cooperative. But because it's done using transition thinking, it's been a catalyst for so much more than that. There's now a, a cooperative set up growing the food to sell in the shop. There's a wind energy cooperative set up for the, uh, for, for, for the valley. And one of the things that found a home there was this uh, local bakery called the Handmade Bakery. They make the most fantastic bread. They needed to raise money to expand their business. They needed £40,000. The bank wanted to charge them 7% interest. But they had members. They're a community-supported bakery. So they went to their members and said, please lend us £40,000. We'll pay you 7% interest, but we'll pay you the interest in bread, <laughs> which cost them 2%. So it's a really great way for, for, for a young family to start a business and for that business to become viable. And this is in a, a place called Topsham, and they've been doing transition for about a year, and they said, what is it that we think in this town that really brings people together, really unites people? Is it peak oil? Mm. Is it climate change? Mm. Is it beer? Yeah, it could be beer, actually. <laughs> so they started their own brewery, and they raised about £40,000. These are all the people with their shares. And, uh, and they started brew. And I'm in the process at the moment in, in the town where I live of, of starting a community brewery as well. And we're really intrigued about the idea of how a community brewery could become a catalyst for a new economy. Could you have a brewery where every few months you bring out a new bottled beer and you have a, somebody who's trying to start an enterprise in the town and a percentage of the sales go to starting that business and you tell that person's story on the label? So every time people make that choice to support a local brewery, You know, we, people talk a lot about impact investing. I think the kind of impact investing that we need is that kind of internal investment where you can see the impact of that investment on a daily basis as you walk around. Community energy, I was saying last night, I feel a bit of a fraud coming to Germany to talk about community energy because in England we say, well, in Germany they have 50-something percent of all renewables are community-owned, whereas in England it's 3% or something absolutely mortifying. Uh, but I want to just tell you a couple of the stories of, of how transition groups are doing that. This is uh, in Lewis, in Sussex, and the local transition group here set up the first community-owned solar power station in the UK. They raised £350,000 from local people, uh, and this is a brewery. This is the last beer-related story, I promise. They covered, <laughs> they covered the roof of this brewery in 544 solar panels with money from the community, and the brewery brewed a special beer called Sunshine Ale to celebrate. <laughs> 
And I love the idea that you have a brewery that documents the story of the wider community's transition in the names of the beers that it brings out. (laughs) That's just me, I think. This is in Japan, uh, and after the tsunami and the nuclear crisis uh, in Japan, uh, this is in a place called Fujino, which was the first transition initiative in Japan. And they uh, set up their own energy company called the Fujino Electric Company. They had created a, they had acquired a lot of renewable energy infrastructure, but after the, the tsunami, a lot of the communities that were really affected by it were unable to run the festivals that they ran throughout the year, the festivals of light, which were really, really important to them. So the people in Fujino loaded all of their kit up and went to these areas, enabled them to run those festivals. And then when they came back, they were so moved by the experience that actually they, they, they set up this, the Fujino Electric Company. The great thing about it is that that idea of creating your own electric company, since they got started in Fujino, has led to 40 other places across Japan setting up their own uh, community-owned energy companies. This is in the city of Bath in the southwest of England, and I think what they're doing here is fantastic, Bath and West Community Energy. What they've done is create a model which is really important. The, the idea of... I, I went to a, a conference in Manchester the other week that was about place branding. So at the moment, all the cities around the world all try to brand themselves as different things. We're the city of enterprise. No, well, we're the city of cheese or whatever. We're the city of uh, something or other, enterprise, you know, thing. So actually... What they've tried to do there is, is, yeah, so the problem with that is it's all about attracting inward investment. How do we get inward investment? I think the big question alongside that is how do we create internal investment? And I'll come back to that in a minute. But what they've done in Bath is fantastic. Bath and West Community Energy was able to offer, through the model they created, people who invested in them was able to offer them a return from day one, which meant that people could move their pensions into a community-owned energy company which meant that their first share option raised three quarters of a million pounds from local people. And a lot of that was people moving their pensions. If we can start to take our pensions out of the industries that are investing in fossil fuels, that are investing in the destruction and all the harmful practices that we really don't want to support, and into driving local renewables, local food, local economies, that's something really, really powerful. And so we start to see that happening in places like this. And this is Brixton. So some you might say, well, Bath is a relatively wealthy kind of a city. And surely, you know, people who are able to, to, to invest in community renewables, it's going to be the middle class and the wealthier people. This is in Brixton in London. And here they started Brixton Energy as a community-owned energy company. It came out of Transition Brixton. And uh, the first project they did was called Brixton Solar One. And they needed to raise £100,000 to put a solar system, uh, solar PV on the roof of this tower block. This is some of the poorest housing uh, in London. For Brixton Solar One, maybe 25% of the investment came from local people. The rest came from more kind of middle class people in Brixton, thought it was a good idea that they wanted to support. It was such a success that when they did Brixton Energy 2, about six months later, about 70% of the investment came from the people who lived in the buildings underneath. Uh, And they, they trained up local young men in how to become solar installers. The third one, which they're going to be launching later this year, they're hoping it'll be 100% people who live in the building who are going to be investing. People, the minimum share is £250, people for whom £250 is a lot of money, but the return is better than leaving it in the bank. So it's really starting to build uh, a real kind of momentum around renewables in those communities. Another aspect of this is about, again, going back to our leaky bucket, how do we make money cycle locally so that it can't leave? Make money go round as many times as possible before it goes. This is in Brixton again. This is the Brixton Pound. They have David Bowie on their £10 note, which is so much nicer than looking at the Queen every day, I have to say. <laughs> the idea of this is, the idea of this is it's money that, they call it money that sticks to Brixton. So you spend it in local independent businesses. What they developed there, along with Transition Network and New Economics Foundation and a Dutch organization called COIN, is a system where you pay by text. You walk into the shop and you do your shopping by by just sending a text to the shopkeeper. It's a really, really fantastic uh, system. And, uh, and, uh, And then what happened more recently was that the Bristol Pound launched. So the Brixton Pound, Brixton is a small area of London, maybe 90,000 people. The Bristol Pound is a city of 800,000 people. And this man uh, on the far side there is George Ferguson, who is the new mayor of Bristol. They're the first city to elect a new mayor for a long time. And uh, and he he won. And on his inauguration speech, he announced that he would be taking his full salary, £51,000, entirely in Bristol Pounds. 
And then when the Queen visited Bristol the following week, the gift that he presented her with on behalf of the people of Bristol was a presentation pack of Bristol pounds. (laughs) And history uh, does not relate quite what she thought of it, not having her head on it, I don't know. But I have this idea that somewhere in the Tower of London there is a special dungeon reserved for people who print their own money. But he's still there, he's still there anyway. But what's exciting in Bristol is that, is that the city council are really behind it. You can pay your tax in Bristol Pounds. You can pay your business rates in Bristol Pounds. The Bristol Pounds pay their staff, uh, give the option of paying them part of their salary in Bristol Pounds. This is a scale where if this works, it's really interesting. And we get more and more places ringing us every week to ask how you might do this. And thinking strategically is really important. So by this stage, your transition group is starting to develop lots of enterprises. They're starting up uh, and they're getting going. Uh, How do you think about, how do you look at them in a strategic context? So this is a a community-supported agriculture farm in Norwich, which came out of a whole study they did called Can Norwich Feed Itself, where they looked at the city, the land around it, and what it needed to support itself. And this is a picture of a donut, which, uh, why did I put, yes, because because what can happen at this stage in terms of interesting challenges that transition faces is that sometimes what can happen is that then all the energy goes into projects, and how do you hold that bit in the middle? That bit in the middle that is, going, that is continuing the awareness raising, that is continuing to offer the support, that is continuing to say transition matters, that continues to draw these things together. And that kind of donut effect is something that, uh, that, that we start to see. And we're really looking at how we address that and how, how you hold the middle in transition. This is something... How, how are we doing for time? Are we okay? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Don't want to overstay my welcome. I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. This is uh, a project that we we'll, that we will be publishing soon that we've been working on uh, in Transition Town Totnes. And I think this is this is a really really exciting model. This is called the Totnes and District Local Economic Blueprint. So very often if uh, Walmart want to open a supermarket in my town, they can say we will create 25 jobs we will bring a million pounds every year to this community. Those of us who argue that local economies are really important and we need to protect and enhance local economies and that that's where the future of the economy will come from, we don't have those figures. We can't make that case. We tend to say we should do it because it's really good. We should do it because it's kind of more sustainable. We don't have that kind of economic case. What this does, for the first time as far as I'm aware, is it maps the local economy in real detail in terms of food, energy, building retrofits, and how we care for the elderly. Where does all the money go? So we now know, for example, that every year we spend £30 million on food and drink, of which 20 goes out through just two supermarkets. And we have a much bigger local food economy than most other places. That's £20 million leaving our economy every year that could in part at least, be staying locally and stimulating new enterprises. We know that money spent with local businesses creates more jobs, cycles more often locally, has more benefits to the local economy. So we can now say, if we could manage a shift in this community of 10% to local food, that's £2 million in our local economy that wasn't there before. That's the cavalry coming to the rescue. (laughs) It means that we shift from talking about localisation as being an idea and community resilience as being an idea to community resilience being economic development. There's a, there's a real kind of tangible benefit to this in terms of creating work and so on. This will be publishing this in about two weeks. But the exciting thing about this is that this isn't something that was just produced by Transition Town Totnes. This was produced by the District Council, the Town Council, the Chamber of Commerce, the local college, the local school, a whole network of local organisations who've come together around this agenda. It's very, very exciting. And another, another thing that we need to be looking at is about bringing assets into community ownership. All too often, development is something that happens to us. Regeneration is used as this word that's like motherhood and apple pie, that regeneration is always a good thing. But actually, all too often we see in, in towns and cities, regeneration is something that actively undermines local resilience. It sweeps independent traders aside and brings in all the usual chains to dominate the economic life of that place. And the same thing happens with housing, new housing, new development. This is a project that I'm involved in, as you can see, uh, which is where we are working to bring an old eight-acre derelict industrial site in the middle of our town into community ownership. 
We've many, many hundreds of people come out to support this. And it's about what does that look like if we own the assets and develop the assets so the community decides what happens there and benefits from it. How can development become a catalyst for community resilience, for economic resilience? And that's what we really hope to develop on that side. Yep, perfect, perfect. So the last stage we call daring to dream, which is actually, well, where could this all go? What would this look like if every town and city had its own currency, its own energy company, its own food systems, all that kind of thing? What would that actually look like? One of the things that I find really fascinating about transition is how how it spreads. So it's not a top-down model. It's not a Coca-Cola franchise. This is something which is owned and driven by by people. And I increase this is a mycorrhizal fungus. This is a particular kind of a fungus that you find in undisturbed forests. And it runs incredibly fine and it holds that forest together. It becomes the neural network uh, that informs that woodland. If I had a cube that big of of topsoil rich in mycorrhiza, it would have about eight miles of mycorrhiza in it. It becomes how the wood communicates with itself. It's what creates the resilience. And, tr- and it fruits sometimes in places you expect and sometimes places you don't expect. Transition is like you inoculate a place with that culture and it runs. And a lot of it runs underneath the surface. People, might, people come to where I live and say, oh, I can't see any transition going on here. Imagine they're going to see big windmills and goats grazing on the roof, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know, but actually a lot of it runs beneath the surface. So when we talk about the end of the age of cheap energy, the end of this, that and the other, every end is a new beginning. And I think actually, I I think that the possibilities at this stage are really, really thrilling of what we can create from, from this point moving forward. So the way that I like to think about it is like this. So we could think of the last 150 years of the oil age as being like an enormous mountain that we've climbed using our ingenuity, our brilliance, our scientific uh, 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 skills to climb to the top of this mountain. And now we stand with more energy underneath our feet than any civilization has ever known. We can see extraordinary things. We have insights and views that no one could ever have dreamt of in the past. And now we have to work out how we get down again. And when we look at it like that, it becomes a move away from something. It becomes a walk down the hill in the rain. It becomes a sort of a a, a leaving something that felt like it was the best we could have ever had. What we like to do in transition is to flip that upside down (laughs) and say, actually, maybe we could look at the oil age as being like a big, deep, dark lagoon that we dived into because we were told that if only we could dive deeply enough, there was great treasures and gold lying at the bottom for us that would really make us happy. Finally, we would be happy. And we've dived deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper we've dived, the the less we've been able to see each other. It's become darker. We've, We've lost contact with each other. It has become more and more isolating. And now we are down at the bottom, rootling around, looking for our, looking for the gold. When we look at it like that, actually, then the move away from that isn't a move away from something. It's a move towards something. It's a move towards being able to see each other again, seeing the light again, seeing the fresh air, hearing the birds again. It becomes a move towards something which is much more nourishing, which is about good livelihoods, about good food, about people, about community, about renewable energy, all that kind of thing. Uh, It's certainly what gets me out of bed every morning, and I hope that it's something that you might... um, you might want to put your shoulder to trying to make happen uh, following this evening. <clears throat> if you'd like to know any more about what we do, uh, here are some different things, there's some, some links, and the website where you can find out about all that's happening in Germany and uh, if there are local initiatives near you that you could get involved with. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. I think it was inspiring and um, you created already a lot of hope. Uh, And not only by dreaming, but by doing. That's, I think, a very good news. Uh, Okay, Renate. You want to react immediately? Please. Herzlichen Dank, Rob, für das, äh, die wirklich sehr inspirierende Erzählung. 
muss man erstmal Luft holen und denkt, was kann ich jetzt dazu noch sagen. Ne? Was mich begeistert hat, ist, ich sag mal als erstes, die Kavallerie. Das hatte nämlich vielleicht ein doppelt und dreifach schönes Bild. Äh, vielleicht gibt es in England Menschen, die sich so anziehen und dann losreiten. Wir hier sind das nicht so gewöhnt äh, in diesem bunten Uniform. Aber das Wort Kavallerie, äh, der Begriff äh, macht ja noch was anderes. Nämlich ereignet sich ein Begriff an, und eine Institution, ja, also very traditional, würden die vielleicht äh, als Garde der Königin zu irgendeinem Geburtstag mitreiten. Eine, sie sind eine Institution und ereignet sich dieses Bild an. Eine Kavallerie ist stark, weil sie nämlich nicht nur menschliche und human power hat, sondern auch Pferdestärke. Und sie ist eben vom Bild her mit den Uniformen, die wir gesehen haben, was sehr Traditionelles mitten in der Gesellschaft. Und das finde ich... Hat ja dieses, haben ja diese Projekte alle dargestellt. Sie haben dargestellt mit der Transition, dass das eine Veränderung ist, die mitten in der Gesellschaft stattfindet. Das ist keine Nische, wo ein paar Leute mal auf eine verrückte Idee gekommen sind und in der Nische bleiben, sondern die Aneignung des Bilds der Kavallerie sagt auch, wir sind mitten in der Gesellschaft, mitten in der Tradition. Wir haben Leute, die in dem Land leben und er hat es ja auch dargestellt, selbst in Gebieten, die nicht viel Geld haben, also nicht nur der Luxus von Reichen, die sagen, kann ich noch mal in eine Solaranlage investieren, sondern Menschen, die auch in sehr einfachen Wohngebieten leben, engagieren sich und packen Geld zusammen. Mich hat inspiriert die Idee, dass Begriffe, die ich oftmals erst oder vielleicht viele von uns mit Landwirtschaft assoziieren, jetzt plötzlich im Alltagsleben überhaupt angekommen sind. Permakultur, Kreislaufwirtschaft. Würde man als erstes sagen, kommt ja, kriegst du jetzt einen Agrarvortrag. Ja? Die Kreislaufwirtschaft, ja, dass du in den Acker keinen chemisch-synthetischen Dünger reinpackst, kein Monsanto, Saatgut und ähnliches sondern so richtig Kreislauf wird schon betreibt, den Humus wieder wachsen lässt und daraus werden dann gute Lebensmittel ohne äh, Rückstände, ja, chemische Rückstände oder so. Und jetzt kommt diese Permakultur, der Kreislauf, mitten in die Stadt. Das ist erstmal als Bild überraschend. Das ist mitten in der Stadt und... Was ich auch faszinierend finde, in der Stadt, wo du dir, wo man sich so vorstellt, in dem Haus, in dieser Wohnung wohnt diese Familie, jene Familie, Singles, Wohngemeinschaften, löst diese Idee von Transition plötzlich dieses Individuelle auf und macht es zu etwas Gemeinsamen. Also nicht jeder alleine sitzt am Frühstück oder am Abendbrottisch und muss sich überlegen, was könnte ich denn tun? Gehe ich noch zu dieser Demo, äh, kaufe ich jetzt einen Liter Ökomilch? Jede Woche, um anzufangen, ja, meinen Beitrag zu leisten mit fairen Preisen für die Bauern, kümmere ich mich um die Energie in meinem Haus und den Verbrauch. Nee, er macht es gleich so, dass er sagt, diese Bewegung macht es so, dass sie sagen, nein, wir machen es zusammen. Also von dem, was das Individuum an Mängeln hat oder an vielleicht Einsamkeitsgefühlen gegenüber dieser Übermacht von vielleicht mafiösen Energiestrukturen. Ja, in Deutschland vier Energiekonzerne stehen da und wie soll ich alleine da jetzt gegenwirken? Da können wir ja immer schön erzählen, ja, wenn erstmal alle ummelden und den Strom anders beziehen oder so, dann werden wir eine große Masse. Aber ob das jeder alleine tut, ist die Frage. Transition heißt, wir treffen uns zusammen, war ja der Punkt eins, ja, sich tatsächlich zu treffen und zu reden, sich zu verbinden, also connecting, das finde ich eine faszinierende Geschichte. Ich finde faszinierend, dass eben nicht das Individuum einer festen Struktur gegenübersteht, sondern bei, diesem, bei dieser Idee, wir gehen aus dem fossilen, aus dem Erdölzeitalter in ein anderes, neues, erneuerbares Zeitalter, macht er was ganz Neues auf. Politisch spannend, warum? Weil wir normalerweise vielleicht Parteien, aber auf alle Fälle NGOs und Bürgerinitiativen im klassischen Sinne kennen, die sich für etwas engagieren. Ja, dass diese Vögel bessere Bedingungen haben, dass hier weniger Chemie einsetzt, da kein Atomkraftwerk, das sind themenzentrierte NGOs. Und hier verändert sich auch die NGO und trifft, spricht die Menschen auf eine ganz besondere Art und Weise an und fragt, äh, also du musst jetzt nicht gleich mit, mit einer Umweltgruppe oder einer großen Kampagne die gesamte Energiepolitik Deutschlands verändern wollen, und Fachperson werden, sondern fang in deinem Dorf, in deiner Kleinstadt, in deiner Straße an. Also ein ganz anderes Bild von NGO, das ist einfach die Frage, wo bewege ich mich in meinem Alltag, wo lebe und wo arbeite ich, 
sozusagen als Andockstelle für Aktionen macht. Das Faszinierende daran ist also, dass sich Kreislaufwirtschaft in die Stadt bewegt, können wir auch, wobei Städte ja sonst immer sozusagen wie so ein Staubsauger alle Ressourcen des Landes aufsaugen und den meisten Energieverbrauch haben. Nee, jetzt kommt, wir machen Permakultur auch in der Stadt, jetzt kommt, wir haben neue Zusammenarbeitsformen, Kooperationsformen, die sich wo du auch die Möglichkeit hast, dich für ein, zwei kleine Projekte zu engagieren. Du kannst in die Bäckerei gehen, ja, um du was machen, um auch Geld zu haben. Du kannst äh, gucken, dass du auf öffentlichen oder Privatgebäuden Photovoltaikanlagen organisierst und dann vielleicht wieder aussteigen. Also es gibt die Möglichkeit, das klein zu, in ganz kleinen und einzelnen Punkten zu machen. Und was mich begeistert, äh, du hast das Wort selber benutzt, das ist, äh, du hast the middle gemacht, a transition in the middle. Äh, in the middle ist ja vielleicht gar nicht geografisch gemeint, sondern vielleicht auch als Kern gemeint. Da passte das Donutbild auch zu. Ja? Der Donut war die Masse um das Loch und die Menschen, die da aktiv waren, war das Loch. Es ist wie schwarze Löcher ne? im Weltall, wo keiner weiß, was es ist, aber da soll sich irgendwas Wichtiges befinden. Ist auch so, weil der Kern ist der Alltag der Menschen. Du kriegst, du kriegst den Umbau von fossilen Zeitalter, vom Erdölzeitalter zu einem, ich sage mal, erneuerbaren Zeitalter, ja nur hin, wenn in diesen, dieser luftleeren Mitte der Donuts tatsächlich was stattfindet. Wenn die Menschen im Alltag anders einkaufen, ihre, mit ihrer Energie anders umgehen, das fand ich eigentlich das faszinierend. Und ich habe dabei an ein Puzzle gedacht. Anderes Bild. An einem Puzzle, wenn du eine Landschaft darstellen willst oder einen Gegenstand, wird es nie funktionieren ohne den Alltag der Menschen und ohne die Menschen. Da würde immer ein großes Loch bleiben in der Mitte. Man kann das nicht nur theoretisch machen, sondern man muss es auch so aufbauen, dass die Menschen sich selber dafür engagieren kann, über diese Dinge im Alltag tatsächlich nutzen. Und der vierte Punkt, der mich fasziniert hat, ist, dass diese Ideen, das Ökologische und das Soziale, in Wahrheit zueinander bringen. Das ist jetzt hier nur kurz angesprochen worden. Also Transition zum Beispiel im Energiebereich so oder Rohstoffbereich hat hier ja die grandiosen Nebeneffekte, dass er Menschen zueinander bringt und vielleicht auch eine Antwort ist auf die Einsamkeit in den Städten, immer mehr Single-Haushalte, die Städte immer größer, du musst von A nach B, von Wohnung zum Kindergarten, zur Schule, zu deinem Arbeitsplatz fahren und hier plötzlich geht nicht jeder in seine Wohnung, zieht die Tür zu, sondern man hat in der Straße und in dem Stadtteil etwas, was man gemeinsam erreichen und verbessern will. Und man kann noch weitergehen, als Rob Hopkins bisher vorgestellt hat. Ja, man kann ja ich war ein bisschen zum Kindergarten, zur Altenpflege, du könnt, man könnte weitermachen und sagen, wir tun es anders. Wir tun es anders. Wir wollen raus aus dem fossilen Zeitalter. Man könnte auch richtig Einkaufskampagnen machen. Man könnte anfangen, gemeinsam einzukaufen. Ja, direkt beim Bauern, dem Zwischenhandel sagen, wenn ihr beim Zwischenhandel 50 Prozent des Preises ausmacht, bestellen wir direkt. In Italien gibt es das so, so, ich sage mal, Agrarkommunen, die in den Städten sind, wo Leute gemeinsam einkaufen und direkt ordern. Ja? Nudeln, Pasta in einer kleinen mittelständischen Pastafabrik, irgendwo Apfelsinen und natürlich eimerweise Wein. Ja? Direkt beim Winzer, deshalb preiswerter, einmal angeliefert, ist auch einfacher. Und dadurch heißt es auch, dass, im, dass sich auch was tut für den ländlichen Raum. Du kannst gezielt sagen, so komme ich an viel mehr ökologische Produkte oder so komme ich, erhalte ich Artenvielfalt. Worum es ja auch geht, ja? Artenvielfalt zu erhalten als Basis fürs weitere Leben. Also diese, ich sage mal, wilde Mischung, die sich aus der Aktion bringt, das Ökologische mit dem Sozialen hier auch teilweise mit dem Schwerpunkt Energie zu verbinden. Ich finde, dass da nach oben noch ganz viel Luft drin ist. Das finde ich das Spannende. Das selber machen und auch zu erkennen, dass man ein wichtiges, Puzzlestück ist. Ich habe mich gefreut an der Stelle, das muss ich mal sagen, dass das bei mir ein paar Andockstellen hinbringt. Diese Transition-Bewegung weist uns ja auf eines hin, nämlich, dass die Menschen vor Ort teilweise erst Bewegung politisch geschafft haben, die andere nicht wollten. Weil du es ja angesprochen hast, ja, mit der mir Bürger-Solaranlage gerade und du scheust dich damit, nach Deutschland zu kommen. Ja, es ist wahr, bei uns ist beim Strom, nicht, noch nicht bei der Wärme, aber in Deutschland ist 50 Prozent des installierten erneuerbaren Stroms in Bürgerhand. Das heißt, das war die Speerspitze der Bewegung. Ja, und jetzt muss ich mal sagen, wie viel Strom haben wir heutzutage auf dem Markt? 25 Prozent erneuerbaren Strom. Und das ist so viel, dass stundenweise am Tag, außer in diesem Winter, wo immer nur, ja, ihr wisst, was ich meine, 
Tatsache ist, dass mehrere Stunden am Tag, wenn Sonne da ist und Wind, mehrere Stunden am Tag unser Bedarf in Deutschland 100 Prozent aus erneuerbaren Energien gespeist wird und dass Atomkraftwerke, Kohlekraftwerke sehr, sehr teuer runter und irgendwann nach vielen Stunden wieder raufgefahren werden, sodass deren Geschäftsmodell, deshalb sind die auch alle so stinkig über den ja, den Zuwachs der erneuerbaren Energie, weil deren Geschäftsmodell kaputt geht und so mancher Vorstandsvorsitzender sich fragt, wie erkläre ich es meinen Aktieninhabern. Das haben, und von diesen 25 Prozent, wie gesagt, die Hälfte in Bürgerhand. Das heißt, dieses Puzzlestück oder dieser Luftraum im Donut, diese Bürger in der Mitte der Gesellschaft, haben wirklich was geschafft. Haben wirklich was geschafft. Die viertgrößte Industrienation muss ihr gesamtes Energiesystem umbauen. Deshalb müssen wir die Netze bauen. Äh, um zum Beispiel zu jetzt müssen wir uns schon überlegen, wie wir später mal einigen Kohlekraftwerken versprechen, eine bestimmte Menge Strom im Winter abzunehmen, damit die nicht die Bude ganz dicht machen. Ja, so sicherheitshalber, wir sind ja klug, ja, für ein paar Jahre des Übergangs. Daran sieht man, welche, welche Masse, welche kritische Masse so eine Bewegung entwickeln kann. Und ich bin überzeugt davon, dass Transitionstädte das auch können. Weil sie, genau das, ja, weil du da nämlich nicht nur die Einzelnen hast, die vielleicht mal ein paar Euro anlegen, sondern ganze Stra Straßenzüge und Städte, die sagen, wir investieren unser Geld da rein, wir, wir installieren das jetzt bei uns selber und alle in der Addition sind dann ein Problem. Es gibt einen Satz von Arnold Schwarzenegger, der mir bei deiner Rede eingefallen ist, den ich mal gut fand. Ich wollte den nicht vergleichen. Nee, das war in den letzten paar Wochen... Ja, Power hast du, ja. In den letzten paar Monaten von George Bush Präsidentschaft gab es mal im Westen der USA ein Treffen der Klimaschutzstädte. Da gibt es ja auch eine Alliance der Klimaschutzstädte. Ich glaube, fünf, vier, fünfhundert Klimaschutzstädte haben sich da getroffen und hatten sich, ich weiß nicht warum, aber sie haben es getan, Arnold Schwarzenegger als Keynote-Speaker eingeladen. Aber dann sagte er, wirklich in den letzten Monaten von George Bush, wir sind viele, wir können das, wir machen Klimaschutz, wir bauen die Energie um, wir essen anders, weil auch Nahrungsmittelproduktion, Klimabelastung sind, wir machen den Transport von Menschen und Gütern anders und rief am Ende, was tosenden Applaus auslöste, mit dem Zeigefinger gen Osten, Washington zeigend, und Washington ist nur ein kleiner schwarzer Punkt auf der Landkarte der USA. Toller Satz. Ich, das funktioniert so und ich sage euch das jetzt an der Stelle, weil 25 Prozent erneuerbarer Strom, zu, der zu 50 Prozent im Bürgerhand löst aus, dass Deutschland sein ganzes Stromsystem, das Netzsystem, die ganzen Marktstrukturen neu organisieren muss, weil früher gab es vier Besatzungsmächte, also die vier Energiekonzerne, jeder hatte die Macht der Stromproduktion und die Macht über die Netze und es war ein Oligopol. Und das finde ich das Faszinierende. Also diese, diese Einzelnen Städte, diese einzelnen Aktionen, und das hast du ja auch aufgemacht, können sich ja noch weiter, im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes, weiter verbinden, um Größeres zu tun. Darf ich mir was wünschen? Ich würde mir wünschen, dass diese Vernetzung, die bei dem Bild mit den Wurzeln, ja, wie das Ganze sich, ne, how to spread, wie sich das Ganze weiter verbreitert, dass diese Vernetzung auch anfängt, sich tatsächlich bis hin in den Bereich Politik auszudehnen. Und zwar auch ganz bewusst selber politisch an, noch weitere politische Forderungen stellt, nämlich, wofür gebt ihr das Geld aus? Diese Frage auch noch zu stellen. Dieses, wofür, wofür gebt ihr das Geld aus in der Politik, ist ja eine, das ist sozusagen die nächste Stufe vom Individuellen zum Gemeinsamen und dann ran an die Fleischtöpfe. Wer kriegt das Geld? Zu wem wird es gegeben? Wofür gibt es Subventionen? Warum unterstützt ihr uns nicht, die wir eben nicht nur einige große, aber die wir vor Ort sozusagen so viele Städte und Dörfer ausbauen? Ist ja so, du kannst Deutschland oder England mit Transition-Städten, du hast immer mehr Punkte und irgendwann ist das ganze England grün. Verzeiht mir, die Farbe ging nicht anders. Ja, die ganze Landkarte ist dann grün. Ist doch so, oder? Wenn alle, ja, wenn alle sich auf die, wenn alle sich sozusagen darauf auf den Weg machen, Transition-Stadt zu sein, alle sich, ja, die Anlagen auf die Dächer im Kindergarten, in den Kantinen, in den Mensen, wird, äh, gibt es nicht nur Veggie-Days, sondern wird ökologischer gegessen, werden, werden Verträge mit Bauern aus der Region gemacht, um den Anteil, ne, wie du erzählt hast, ihr, ihr importiert Kartoffeln. Ähm, wird der Anteil des Regionalen, das sozusagen wenige Food Miles beim Transport bis zu dieser Küche hat, sozusagen systematisch äh, erhöht. Und dann 
ja, wenn du das alles immer schraffieren würdest, wäre irgendwann ganz England grün. Also äh, so würde ich es mir vorstellen. Das heißt aber, dass man dann wirklich fragt, nochmal, wofür gebt ihr das Geld aus? Wo werden die Gelder hingeschickt? Wird immer Geld ausgegeben für große Konzerne, für große Autos? Wie werden die mit Subventionen gepempert? Oder sagt er jetzt nach getreu dem Satz, alles Gute wächst von unten? Von oben wächst sowieso nichts. Organisch wächst immer von unten. Das heißt auch, dass wir wollen, dass ihr uns unterstützt. Wir wollen, dass ihr in Kommunen, die wenig Geld haben und wo die Leute nicht so viel investieren können, dass ihr sozusagen nicht nur in der Nordsee, ich glaube, die braucht man, ja, Nordsee-Windräder ein paar in der großen Industrienation, aber wir wollen, dass ihr nicht nur da investiert, sondern die lokalen Initiativen auch finanziert. Das Geld ganz gezielt bei einer Photovoltaikanlage von gibt es so viel dazu. Und zwar einfach als Zuschuss und nicht als Kredit, weil es ein Klimaschutzzuschuss ist, der sich eines Tages auszahlt. Mein Wunsch ist, das auch einzufordern. Das auch einzufordern und vielleicht muss man ja nicht Arnold Schwarzenegger einladen, der ist jetzt eh durch, ladet jemand anders ein, aber dieses zu formulieren, um mal aufzumachen, aufzumachen und ich will euch Beispiele nennen, zu fordern, dass es endlich wieder Energiehandel, äh, Emissionshandel gibt. Solange es zu viel Zertifikate gibt, würden die auch nicht gehandelt. Macht es auch für manche keinen Sinn, richtig effizienter zu sein. Solange man für, dafür nicht zahlen muss, haben wir auch ein Problem, sozusagen einen Energiefonds finanziell auszustatten. Zwingt die Großindustrie runterzugehen oder für Zertifikate zu zahlen und das Geld, das sie zahlen, kommt in einen Energiefonds. Dieser Energiefonds kann Energieberatung vor Ort unterstützen, kann Anschaffung effizienter Elektrogeräte, Klimawohngeld oder in solche Projekte, in denen Bürger sich selber engagieren, investieren. Oder investiert das Geld in die Sanierung von Stadtteilen, wenn Menschen sich vor Ort zusammentun und miteinander diskutieren, wie möchten wir, dass unsere Stadt, unser Stadtteil in 10, 15 Jahren ist. Wie wollen wir das Zusammenleben von Generationen organisieren und finanzieren? Äh, Wäre auch ein Punkt zu sagen, da bitte schön soll Geld rein und soll die soziale Stadt unterstützt werden. Also es gibt eine Menge Angebote. Oder wir wollen... Das gehört ja auch dazu, sage ich für Deutschland, ich glaube, woanders ist es auch nicht anders. Wieso gebt ihr immer Geld für mehr Asphalt aus? Wir wollen ja nicht, wir wollen, dass eines Tages ganz England grün ist oder auch Deutschland und nicht, dass alles asphaltiert ist. Ja, aber die Gelder werden im Bundesverkehrswegeplan für den Asphalt ausgegeben, ohne Ende. Ohne Ende, selbst wenn man da mal eine Viertelstunde im Stau steht. Ja. Aber zu sagen, wir wollen, dass ihr das umbaut, hier sind 30 Städte, die sagen, wir brauchen mehr Geld für ein Nahverkehrssystem und wollen es verbunden haben mit dem Fernverkehr. Wer investiert in, äh, in den Radverkehr, in Radverkehrsnetze und Ähnliches? Also die Fragen muss man stellen. Und ich glaube, dass wir politisch längst an einer Wegscheide sind, wo wir das auch mit Werbe einfordern können. Wir sind ja viele wir sind viele, und wenn ihr euch das überlegt, von Anti-AKW-Bewegung bis zu Transition Work, äh, wie viel eigentlich da zusammen äh, sind, gibt es eine Menge an Forderungen, die man klar stellen kann. Warum gibt es bei der KfW die gleiche Förderung für Styroporsanierung? Ihr wisst, was ich meine. Ja? Alles, was heutzutage gebaut wird, wird äh, gedämmt mit Styropor, was dazu führt, dass in weiß nicht, tausend Jahren bei Ausgrabung, die Leute sagen, sie waren so intelligent, sie waren auf dem Mond, ja? sie hatten Satelliten rundum, sie konnten Solarpanels bauen und was noch alles, Hybridfahrzeuge, why the hell haben sie alles mit Styropor, das nicht sich von alleine auflöst, saniert? Das ist die Frage. Und wisst ihr was? Du kriegst für nachwachsende Rohstoffe zur Isolierung eines Hauses genauso viel Geld wie für Styropor. Nachwachse sind aber ein bisschen teurer, lösen sich aber in Wohlgefallen auf oder werden mal zu Humus. Styropor bleibt ewig und wird bei Ausgrabung gefunden. Obskur im 21. Jahrhundert. Also warum nicht fragen, hier sind Städte, die auf sich auf die Transition, den Transition-Weg machen und wir wollen, dass ihr da oben endlich die Förderbedingungen verändert, damit wir auch an der Stelle beim Sanieren sagen, auf der richtigen, im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes, auf der richtigen Seite sind. Das ist meines Erachtens die ganz große, die ganz große Frage, bei der wir gerade stehen. How it spreads, hast du am Ende gesagt. Ich wünsche mir also, dass diese ganze Bewegung, die sich mit Energie beschäftigt, mit Bauen, mit, mit bis hin zum Food, bis zu den Lebensmitteln, sich so richtig ausbreitet und wie gesagt vernetzt und will finde, dass das eine wunderbare Idee ist und die Idee einer ganz neuen Art von Bürgerinitiative statt der klassischen NGOs oder Parteien, um tatsächlich dieses neue Zeitalter zu begründen und das Erdölzeitalter zu beenden. Du hast am Ende so schön den Peak Oil nach unten in den Boden gesetzt. Dann war es ein schwarzer, tiefer See. Jetzt muss ich euch einen Spruch sagen, der mir dabei einfiel. Ich habe mir überlegt, wenn man da jetzt reintaucht, was findet man da? 
Ich glaube, man findet Steine. Und auf einem dieser Steine steht eine Botschaft aus dem Steinzeitalter. Die heißt einfach, steigt aus dem Erdöl aus. Wir haben im Steinzeitalter auch aufgehört, bevor die Steine zu Ende waren. Ja, ganz wunderbar, Renate, für deine ebenfalls ermunternde, ermutigende, ergänzende Kommentierung. Ähm, jetzt ist es so, dass wirklich die knappe halbe Stunde bleibt, damit Sie Fragen stellen können. Ich möchte jetzt auch ehrlich gesagt nicht hier erst auf dem Podium, sondern wir gehen jetzt gleich zu Ihnen. Uns hören auch und schauen Menschen im Livestream zu. Die können auch Fragen stellen oder werden Fragen stellen. Das kann dann sein, dass wir die auch noch reinbekommen. Ich möchte Sie jetzt einfach bitten, es gibt Zahlmikrofone. Es kommen auch Leute zu Ihnen mit Mikros, oder? Ja, oder, oder Sie stellen sich zum Teil auch hinter die Mikros und sagen Sie kurz, wer Sie sind und sagen Sie auch, an wen Sie eine Frage haben. Bitte, los geht's. Gehen Sie ans Mikro, da steht's, in der, in der Mitte steht's. Das ist, an. das ist immer an. Es springt an. Bin ich ja, vielen Dank, ich bin Helmut Wurmann, ich wohne in Berlin und bin auch sozial aktiv. Und vielen Dank, Frau Renate Künast, für Ihren Beitrag. Jetzt haben Sie eine Menge Forderungen auch an uns Menschen gestellt und die waren auch gut, die unterstütze ich sehr. Ich glaube allerdings, die Transition Town Bewegung, die hat einiges an Vorteile und einer dieser Vorteile ist eben auch, dass sie unabhängig der gängigen Politik ist und dadurch, dass sie auf soziale Dinge basiert. Und daher war meine Frage at Europe, if you could pose some questions or like what would you ask from politicians to what they should do to help the Transition Town Movement without inv getting involved in so that the Transition Town Movement stays free? But that it get helps from polit politics. What would you need? Hello, does this work? Yeah. Uh, it's fine now okay. that you are going to react, but I would like to prefer to collect yeah, a, few uh, yeah, a few questions. Otherwise, uh, it's not participatory enough, I guess. Yeah, I, you can get a pen and. A... Okay. Tillman? Soll ich weitermachen? Yeah. Tillman Santarius. Uh, Rob, thank you for this great uh, input. Very inspiring. Um, and I mean, it, I think it's fascinating to see how transition initiatives are booming in all different kinds of places. You said it's more than 2,000 worldwide. A lot of the concepts you are building on, like local currencies, for example, have been practiced since uh, decades. In Germany, we have the Chiemgauer, which is very famous. But Or like permaculture, it's invented in Australia and is all over the place. But a lot of these singular concepts have remained like rather singular and now transition initiatives is booming and it is expanding and is uh, attracting so many people. What's your answer? Why is it that this is so, uh, so much expanding and, and what's, what's so sort of different to all these other initiatives which have, which have been trying this for, for many decades? Thanks. Okay, one more. Hans Verholm, I live here in Berlin, but I think I'm a global citizen. Um, the, the piece of your presentation that fascinates me most um, is probably the hardest. It's the jobs piece. Um, we're all enthusiastic and politically active, sometimes in parties and sometimes not. But what we are terrible at is creating jobs. And, and I'm really interested to, hear, to get you to say more about how the transition communities that you work with have jumped from engaging and testing some of the tools that build on decades of experimenting worldwide and jump into this, we are actually going to rebuild our local economy and with jobless rates in the order of 20% in Europe and for youth even much higher, that's, I think, the crucial bit that will allow you to, to then influence politics. Without it, I think you are at the risk of sliding back into, in, towards the niche. Would you like to answer or would you get another one? Yeah, okay. 
Okay. Fun, what great questions. Um, yeah, so the party politics it's point. Country. It's a great, it's a great everything. Yeah. Um, the, the party political question is really important, actually, because, yeah, it's very, very much determinedly non, non-party aligned. Uh, and, and one of the key reasons for that, I think, is because transition is, is, a, is a social technology, if you like, which is designed to work at the local level. So the economic blueprint, which I talked about for Totnes, that had all those organisations signed up to it, that wouldn't have happened if we, had, if we had an explicit party connection. That needed to be a process which people of all kind of uh, hues could get involved in. There are aspects of transition that appeal to the right, that appeal to the left, that appeal to the Greens. Uh, and I think, you know, sometimes people say, oh, transition isn't political. You know, I think actually transition is very political and actually is, and, and is, and, but is, is skillfully so because it's not aligned to any particular parties. And that's kind of where its power lies at the local level, that we can put on an event and we can invite people from all the different uh, political perspectives and they feel that they, that they, feel they belong to it, that, it, that it's something that, that, that they see themselves in. And that's the only way we're going to do it at the local level, I think. And I think that there's a big... Uh, you know, you know, I come very much from the kind of permaculture kind of alternative movement, and there's a huge amount in there that I've had to learn in terms of uh, which I think that often there isn't that much awareness of in terms of the language that we use and how we look and how we the words that we use and how we present our case, which actually within the kind of people who agree with us is just how we communicate. But to other people, it can often just be a complete turn-off. And so I think that, that that's, that's kind of been something in transition that we've really tried to learn, is how do you communicate these ideas so they appeal um, across the spectrum? Uh, in terms of the, the, the question about uh, permaculture and local currencies, absolutely, transition is something which stands on the shoulders of, of many things and learns from those things. And, and there's lots of things I wouldn't claim for a second that transition invented the idea of local currencies or invented the idea of renewables or all these kind of things. I suppose transition is a... Is, is a um, in terms of the, yeah, the question of what's different about transition, uh, I think it's... I think that very kind of positive solutions focus at a time when <clears throat> climate change and peak oil and issues like that and the economic situation, it's very hard to see anything, find anything positive in that situation. So I think transition is, is, is different in that sense. I think uh, the whole kind of aspect, the kind of personal resilience side of transition is, is, is quite different. You know, that I talked before about the kind of the activist model, if you just have to keep going, uh, you know, I'll save the world even if it kills me kind of spirit is something that really hasn't done anybody any favors. And so designing in that thing that we're in this, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We're in this for the long haul, and we have to protect ourselves and, and, our, and our energy, that kind of thing. And then, I don't know, I suppose the rest of it, why transition feels different, you need to ask to the people who, who are doing transition, I guess. Uh, um, in terms of jobs, I mean, this, this is very much... When we did the first book, the, the, the Transition Handbook, which, which some of you will have, will, will have read, that was written quite early on in the, in the evolution of, of transition. And... Uh, um, when we started writing, and that had the, what we called the 12 steps of transition in it as the model. And then what happened was when, when we wrote the next one, The Transition Companion, we went back out to everybody doing transition and said, what are you doing? How, how's it going? Tell us what you're doing. And one place would say, well, we did the first step and then we didn't like the next two. So we did a fourth one and then we did the 12th one. And then what were the rest again? I can't remember. And then another place would say we did the second and the third and then we did something else. And actually everybody was putting these things together in a different way. But when we asked people, well, you know, when we, we went out with the idea thinking, wouldn't it be great if the 13th step was social enterprise, people creating new livelihoods? When we went out to research it with people, they were already doing it. They were starting their new shops. They were starting uh, food businesses. That was already underway. <clears throat> and in terms of what we do to cultivate it, uh, again, I think that's different in every place. And at the moment, we're really trying to push. We have a project called the Reconomy Project, which is a big aspect of transition networks work. So that's reconomy.org. And there you'll find all kinds of tools and inspiring stories and resources for how do you do that? Often those of us who come from the sort of uh, maybe the more kind of left kind of alternative culture, often the idea of turning your work into an enterprise, ooh, there's something kind of instinctively recoils at the, at the idea. And there's a learning there, I think, about, about actually, well, 
So what's the alternative? Do we all just volunteer for the rest of our lives in a few hours that we find on a Wednesday night when we aren't working and we aren't too tired to do, and to, 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 to do something else? So one of the things that we do in, in Totnes that we have the second one coming up is called a Local Entrepreneurs Forum. We do it every year. <clears throat> And uh, the idea is that it brings together people who have ideas for new businesses, people who have experience in business, who have mentor, who can mentor, maybe people who are retired, and people who would like to invest, people who have money that they would like to put into a business. <clears throat> and we cross-pollinate them all. For a day, we do a green dragon's den where people with good ideas pitch their ideas and get feedback. Uh, and that kind of thing can really, really help. But this is a new, this is an emergent area. You know, I don't claim every transition group has set up lots of fantastically successful enterprises. You know, there are examples, but that feels like that's the next thing that we need to achieve. That, as, as, as the gentleman who asked the question said, that's really, I think, where, where we will be tested and where we will be found whether we're successful or not. And for me, the, insp <clears throat> the inspiration is a cooperative movement, which started in the UK in 1850 as a small group of people who had an idea, but actually when they became really meaningful was when they were the idea that then created lots of jobs and i really hope that that's what will happen okay ich würde auch gern eine frage stellen aber erst sind sie dran bitte okay danke schön um, i'm actually one of those transition activists i started transition town panko a year ago so i can speak a bit of um, our experience and i find that um, within the one year, I never met a single person who opposed the tra transition idea, no, never mind where I went, who I spoke to. So it's very, very convincing. Um, but the, economic, uh, the uh, economy is really the main problem, I find, with the people en get engaging people in transition, because... Um, the experience is you can't do it on a Wednesday night basis. And um, a lot of people are so deep in this treadmill that they simply do not have a chance. If you want to reduce your working hours in order to become more active in your own social environment, your boss simply says, no, sorry, you have 40 hours a week plus um, whatever else you need to finish your work and that's what you've got to do. And there's no chance in hell that you will reduce your hours in order to do something social. And um, I find that a lot of people are struggling with that. You know, they would love to be more engaged, but they simply can't. They cannot find jobs that would allow them the time to socialize properly, which I find is what you need most as a transition initiative to make it work, is to have time to speak. If you come together and do a meeting and you have top one, top two, top three, top five, and then time is up, two hours is up, you have to go home, uh, it doesn't work. Because the best ideas always come in the time after you're done with all your tops. <laughs> um, now, the question was, what do we demand of politics? Um, funny thing is, I was, uh, transition gets so much attention, I get... Despite being just a mulling initiative, I get all these invitations now to go to discussion. So I had a discussion at um, the Mercator Stiftung, and there was a, gu a guy from the C CDU, and, uh, from the Conservative Party, uh, from the Enquete Commission, and he asked me... Mr. You know, Meagle? So, do do huh? you mean Mr. Meagle? No. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm terribly bad with names. I meet about 50 new people every day. <laughs> um, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, where was I? Um, <laughs> he, asked, he asked me. You know, he, after a while, he got into the idea and thought, oh, yeah, maybe transition is something to think about. So what should we as the Enquete Commission as a Bundesregierung do in order to help transition initiatives. And the only thing I could come up with is localize, localize government. So the government can locally engage with the local transition initiative to find out where the money should go. Because we don't need... Um, enormous offshore wind crafts, what we need is small local resilient power grids. Um, it's, 
I think that's that's really you know if if I hear Frau Kühner say you know um, we should have demands that's the first demand I can come up with localize everything. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to speak in German. Ja, ich erlaube mir auch eine Frage. Ähm, wenn es gelingen soll, und da knüpfe ich an, dass wir, das hat mit, meiner, mit meinem Alter zu tun, in den 70er Jahren, 80er Jahren, schon einmal, wie ich finde, eine Transition-Bewegung. Wir haben sie Alternativbewegung genannt oder waren Teil davon. Ähm, da sind all die verschiedenen Localize. Kreislaufwirtschaft, zurück aufs Land, anderes Essen. Ich meine, daher kommt ja die ganze ökologische Landbauidee. Und ich glaube, was mich auch umtreibt und viele Leute, die ja absolut unterstützend und sympathisch sind mit der Transition-Bewegung oder mit Ben Vivi und vielen anderen Konzepten, ist ja genau diese, dieses Bedenken, was ich dann habe, ob man es denn tatsächlich schafft, aus dieser Nische herauszukommen. Und ich bin überzeugt davon, dass alle die ganze Bewegung politisch ist, definitiv, aber es geht nicht, ohne dass Politik Rahmenbedingungen stellt und Weichen ändert. Meine Frage an, an, an Rob Hopkins ist in dem Zusammenhang, es, sieht alles, es hört sich alles sehr easygoing an, wie Sie das beschreiben. Wo gibt's eigentlich, wo stoßen Sie eigentlich mit der Bewegung an Grenzen? Wo sind denn auch Rahmenbedingungen, Barrieren da, wo man gar nicht weiterkommt, wo man auch mit der Multiplizierbarkeit, mit dem Spreading nicht mehr weiterkommt, weil man an falsche Strukturen stößt, in denen man sich dann wirklich fast nicht mehr trotz Bewegung richtig verhalten kann. Und das ist die Frage, die mich umtreibt und deswegen auch die Frage, was haben Sie denn, noch an Erwartungen an Politik. Was muss sie denn tun, um Rahmenbedingungen zu ändern, damit Transition Movement sich ausbreiten kann? Und es wäre dann ja auch noch mal hier ein Spiel zurück an Frau Künast. Okay, bitteschön. Ich kann daran, mein Name ist Matthias Heiden, ich kann daran nur anschließen. Um, so my question would be in how far you see the transition movement um, being kind of related to the community organizing movement, which is quite famous in the United States, but which is not about consensus, but going into conflict. Um, and I think, related to the previous answer, where is conflict really still necessary? Even so, we would like to have consensus, but I think we should not forget we need to be conflictual still. Um, And the second question would be in how far, especially if it is also about sustainable economy, as far as I understand, in how far do you discuss, um, let's say, micro-capitalistic behaviors and actions we all have kind of um, incorporated in terms of fair wages and things like this. So in how far does the movement discuss equality in terms of economy? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Astrid Kauser. My background is in cognitive and decision research and probably go closer to the mic. Yes, of course. <laughs> so um, my name is Astrid Kauser. Um, I have a background in cognitive and decision research and uh, thank you for Uh, this really nice term, presentation. There is one aspect which hasn't been mentioned yet, but which I found really um, important in the whole thing. So, um, that is, local means not only local, that I can see what people do around me, but that things get transparent. And that's, in my opinion, one point which politics can learn from the transition movement when politicians think about the ideas and how to make them really like covering a whole country, like Renate Künast mentioned, that whole Great Britain becomes green. So one thing which the transition movement is definitely 
um, is that it is transparent and that I can see what people do around me and that I can see where my money goes. Um, in contrast to this, I don't know where my taxes go. I, even when I look up information on the website of the um Umweltbundesamt, this is not very transparent, actually. Um, so um, I just want to put up the hypothesis that if you make things transparent in environmental politics and also um, in where money is going, um, this will help a lot in order to make this movement much more huge and in, in order to engage much more people in that. Thanks. Um, so the, the lady who talked about her, her transition initiative... Uh, I was thinking, you know, that 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 that, uh, that uh, and she's saying about all the people that she'd met through it. I remember meeting a woman in London who said that she had lived in this part of London for 22 years, and uh, the two years that she'd been involved in transition, she met so many more people, like th th than she had met through in, during those 20 years, and felt so much better connected to the place. And that question about, about, about enterprise and when do you start doing that, you know, there are, there's a, a transition enterprise in America called Jamaica Plains Economic Transitions, and from the beginning, their whole focus is about how do we create work and how do we create enterprise from, from this, which is a very, very interesting thing uh, to look at. Um, and I think, uh, what did I write here? Blueprint, something about that. I, just, I don't even know what that means. Uh, and the localise everything, I think, uh, I don't think it's about localising absolutely everything because different things work on different scales. You know, in Totnes, we aren't going to be able to make our own frying pans and, and computers uh, and electric cars. Different things work on different scales. And the New Economics Foundation have done some really good work on this, that, you know, maybe you start with, with food makes, makes sense first and building materials and energy. And then as you go up in scales, they're, they're, then there are different things that work. I think in terms of politics, one of the big things is going to be about the World Trade Organization and all the kind of rules around protectionism. Uh, and that actually even in my town, I went to ask our local council if they would give us £500 to make a local food directory and were told they couldn't do that because it was seen, would be seen as funding uh, protectionism, uh, which just seemed absolutely extraordinary to me. And the, the economic blueprint that, that, that we published, the local council, what it's done is, is that we went to see them, and they've normally not been that keen on these ideas, but we went to see them and they suggested organising a conference with the county council and other organisations about how they use their purchasing to start to drive this push for 10%. So actually, in terms of how we influence politics, sometimes if you lead by example, those people, kind of, uh, it, you kind of draw them along after you. Um, uh, you asked about the, the, the movement in the 70s and uh, how, how it, the focus was about getting back to the land and back to the country. I think one of the differences with transitions is not about getting back to the country. It's about staying where you are. It's about, well, what does transition look like in the middle of London? Actually, if everybody who's interested in this all moved out to the country and left everybody else behind, you know, and, and, and you mentioned the, the whole uh, urban agriculture question. And I think urban agriculture is going to be one of the big movements uh, of the next 10, 20 years. There is a, a very famous... No, 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 of course it won't feed the whole population, but it will... Uh, <coughs> of a city, no, it won't feed the whole population of a city, but it will make a significant contribution to that. And what it does is it creates work, it creates... Uh, it changes the fabric of that city, it connects people with their food, you know, it's things... Those things that, like herbs and salads that travel long distance that you can just pick from where you are uh, is, is, is really important. Um, and, yeah, and the question about how, whether we can get out of the niche of being alternative and small, I don't know. I can't make a guarantee sitting here today. But then when we started doing this six years ago, we never thought it would even work in, in Totnes. Never mind go to 2,500 other places. And, you know. So I don't know. It's, it's not, it's, it's, you know. We can provide the tools and the resources and hopefully the encouragement, but it's up to everybody whether, whether, if, you, know, whether you want this to happen because no one else is going to do it for you. You know, this is uh, this th this is something about creating some time and some space yeah, to make But Rob, that once again, um, did did you ever are you ever confronted with people who prevent you from doing what you want? Are the no. structures uh, not not in the place you want to 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 spread or to continue to do what you do? Do you know when we started doing transition, there were people who said, "Oh well, of course, if you get successful, they'll try and stop you," and it's never happened. Right. Never happened. Uh, uh, Congratulations. Maybe it will. 
But I think the thing with transition is that it kind of comes under the radar. You know, there was a very interesting question there about the kind of community organising models and the, the, co the confrontational models and, uh, and, and the, the need for people to put themselves in between the things that we don't want to happen. You know, I mean, I'm talking about transition as the positive solutions. Let's create the world we want instead. But, of course, we have to remember uh, that actually the... The, 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 the push for fossil fuels and the push for open cast mining and gas fracking and deep sea oil drilling and all this stuff is still pushing on relentlessly. And actually the people, we still need the people who put their bodies in the way of that happening. Of course we do. But I think that maybe, maybe we're more skillful if we can kind of, if those two things can kind of stand slightly apart from each other. Because actually I know that doing the kind of work that we've been doing, creating this economic blueprint, for example, that if we also were very vocally complaining about the things that we don't want to see, we wouldn't be generating that kind of push. So maybe there's something skillful about seeing those two things as slightly kind of independent from each other. Um, and in terms of how much the movement discusses equality and so on, I think one of the things that has always been an issue with, with transition has been the degree to which you make things explicit and the de degree to which you leave things implicit. So actually, we've never set out a whole manifesto and said, if you start a business in transition, it has to be a cooperative, it has to be based on social justice, it has to be based on fair, fair wages, and da-da-da-da-da. But actually, all the enterprises that are emerging do do that. It's something, it's in the culture, it's in the blood, it's in the DNA of the thing, that when people pick it up, that's, that's then how it gets created. And, and, and the point about transparency, absolutely. I think the thing with transition is, is, it, is it's the people who do it who shape it, uh, and, and, and it should always be open for everybody to see. But of course, you know, we, we need to be saying what, what we want and also saying what we don't want. But like I say, I think maybe they're skillful if they stand apart. Ja, thank you, Rob. Ähm, es ist jetzt so, dass Renate Künast äh, noch auf ein paar ähm, Anmerkungen aus von Ihnen reagieren wird. Sie muss danach gehen. Sie hat nämlich noch eine andere Talkshow heute Abend vor, äh, bei keiner anderen als Maybrit Illner zum Thema äh, Armutsmigration in Europa und wie gehen wir mit den Roma in unserem Land um. Also ein absolut soziales Thema und ein brennendes offensichtlich in ein, 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 einzelnen Städten. Renate, ähm, bitte, und dann werden wir dich ja, verabschieden. Ja, danke. Also ich würde gerne zwei, drei Aspekte hier nochmal aufgreifen, äh, wie wir wohin kommen. Eine Teilnehmerin, eine Aktivistin hat ja ähm, vorhin gesagt, also wenn ich jetzt eine Forderung an die Politik habe, obwohl es die Politik nicht gibt, auch wir sind unterschiedlich, ähm, da hat sie gesagt, localize everything. Jetzt weiß ich gar nicht, ob das am Ende so geht, localize everything, äh, aber nehmen wir es mal an, und was sind die Voraussetzungen dafür, auch nur annähernd da in diese Richtung zu kommen? Ich glaube, dass da der zweite Begriff schon gefallen ist, nämlich das Wort Transparenz. Und das ist aber eine Geschichte, die man, die man übrigens nicht allein in den einzelnen äh, Initiativen machen kann, sondern dazu braucht man auch wieder die gemeinsame Aktivität mit Politik, nämlich zu erkämpfen, dass es Transparenz gibt. Das, und Transparenz heißt aber zweierlei. Also man kann den Bundeshaushalt veröffentlichen und ich könnte sagen, ist doch transparent, oder? Steht ja alles da, versteht nur keiner. Nicht mal alle Abgeordneten, ja? was da steht. Also zu Transparenz gehört noch mehr, dass man sie nämlich flächendeckend macht und zu Transparenz gehört auch Erklären von Zusammenhängen, äh, weil nur mit Erklären und darüber diskutieren kann man überhaupt verstehen, was da gemacht wird. Heißt auch Erklären, weil eine Forderung, bestimmte Dinge zu verändern, nur funktioniert, wenn man verstanden hat, was genau da geregelt ist und, wann man, und wie man es wieder abschaffen kann. Also ist es für mich eigentlich auf dem Weg zu, zum Prinzip lokal, äh, zum, ja, zu zu diesem Bringen wieder in, in Regionen, heißt für mich, dass wir eine richtige Transparenzbewegung haben müssen, äh, die im Übrigen auch eine Transparenzbewegung über Geldflüsse ist. Nicht nur, wer kriegt welche Subventionen, wer hat welche Steuerprivilegien, sondern auch, wofür geben wir eigentlich warum, wie viel Geld aus. Also hier in Berlin wäre es ja, und um Brandenburg wäre es schon nicht uninteressant, wie wir eigentlich auf die horrenden Steigerungen gekommen sind bei einem Flughafen, von dem nicht geflogen wird. Sozusagen, so wie ist das, also das, das zu machen? Und der Witz ist, dass übrigens auch die Phase der Transparenz politisch schon eine Menge bedeutet, weil wenn es transparent ist, wird es diskutiert und wird damit quasi delegitimiert. 
also alte Geldflüsse und also werden delegitimiert und dann wird die Gruppe derer, die sagt, wir wollen nicht nur Transparenz, sondern auch den nächsten Schritt, dass Gelder anders fließen, anders ausgegeben werden. Diese Gruppe kann dann damit immer größer werden. Ich will aber trotzdem sagen, dass dazu auch äh, Politik machen mit dem Einkaufskorb gehört. Wenn ich jetzt fragen würde, ich weiß ja nicht, ob die, die zur Böllstiftung sind, dann alle schon so gut sind, wenn ich jetzt fragen würde, wer hier ähm, bezieht keinen Ökostrom zu Hause, würden sich bestimmt mehr als drei Leute melden müssen. Ich frage es nicht. Gebe es mal nur als... Gebe es mal nur zurück an der Stelle. Also das heißt auch, dass man an andere Massenbewegungen macht und damit politische Zeichen setzt. Wenn die einen Kunden gewinnen und die anderen Kunden verlieren, das war bei Fukushima mal eine richtig große Bewegung, aber ich frage mich, warum geht das jetzt nicht weiter? Ja, den zu sagen, wir haben es satt, wir haben die Nase voll ja, von einem bestimmten System, heißt dann zum Beispiel ummelden. Ich könnte auch fragen, wer hier ernährt sich zu 50 Prozent Bio oder so oder eben nicht, kann man 100, 100 ist schwer, sonst kannst du dich kaum in der Stadt bewegen. Äh, Bankenwechsel. Oder genau, Bankenwechsel. Du zeigst dahin, hinter diesem Vorrang auf der anderen Straßenseite, eine der Ökobanken, quasi die größte deutsche Ökobank, äh, die GLS. Ja? Wer hat sein Konto da? So. Und nicht am falschen Ort. Oder wer würde jetzt mal in seine Jacke gucken und sein Sweatshirt oder so und gucken, wo ist das eigentlich hergestellt worden und unter welchen Bedingungen ist es hergestellt worden? Äh, also an der Stelle sind noch, ja schon gehen alle los, ähm, also an der Stelle gibt es, denke ich, schon, eine ganze, schon noch eine ganze Menge zu tun und daran erkennt ihr, dass wenn man wirklich lokalisieren will, eigentlich kein Lebensbereich davon ausgenommen ist. Und dass man, wenn man auch da in eine Transition Period geht, das ja auch nicht ohne Nebenwirkungen macht. Also ähm, das heißt auch, dass sich in China oder wo immer Leute fragen, was tue ich jetzt? Das heißt im Übrigen auch, dass bei uns ein Lebensstandard und eine Lebensveränderung ist, dass wir Wohlstand für uns selber anders definieren müssen, weil wir selber dann natürlich auch nicht mehr so viel exportieren dürfen, weil dies uns nicht abkaufen würden, sagen, das ist ein Geschäft auf Gegenseitigkeit. Ja, nicht ihr produziert groß und exportiert und äh, wir dann aber nicht mehr, weil ihr jetzt die lokalen Initiativen anfangt. Ich äh, kann nur sagen, da, da steckt eine Wahnsinnsgeschichte hinter, weil man dann tatsächlich seinen Lebens Standard, ich meine jetzt nicht einschränken, sondern der ist verändert. Er ist dann verändert, dann ist es ein Standard des öffentlichen Verkehrs um nicht des Individualverkehrs. Dann muss aber Klamotten das Ende der Wegwerfgesellschaft und H&M H und, und China-Gesellschaft kommen. Ja, und, und, und so. Also da, da steckt schon richtig, da steckt richtig, richtig viel drin. Und weil Rob ähm, die WTO gerade angesprochen hat, da steckt auch drin, dass wir eins zur Kenntnis nehmen müssen, wir sind umzingelt durch, von internationalen Verträgen, die jahrzehntelang betrieben wurden, und da sage ich mal, Attac hat recht, als sie in Seattle gegen die WTO-Verhandlungen protestierte. Äh, diese Verträge haben ja den Staat gezwungen, und zwar in einem Maße, wie Parlamente schon gar nicht mehr entscheiden dürfen, gezwungen, bestimmte Dinge zu tun oder nicht zu tun. Exporte, Importe äh, sind da geregelt. Es ist geregelt, also bis hin dazu, dass wir eigentlich Hormonfleisch aus den USA hier reinlassen müssen und äh, mal ein äh, WTO-Verfahren verloren haben. Wir importieren es trotzdem nicht, weil sonst hier der Aufstand wäre, glaube ich. Äh, aber das ist sozusagen das Problem, das Problem, und deshalb ist es nicht einfach localized, sondern der Punkt ist der, dass wir in unserem gesamten Alltagsverhalten über Jahrzehnte nach und nach umdrehen müssen, andere Schwerpunkte setzen, Wohlstand und das gute Leben anders definieren müssen, das auch mit den anderen woanders auf der Welt mitrechnen müssen. Die müssen sich auch verändern können und wir müssen mit vom TRIPS bis WTO-Abkommen sozusagen mit all diesen rechtlichen Konstruktionen umgehen können. Und deshalb mein dritter Gedanke, denn ich sage, es wird nicht, jemand hat es hier vorhin im Raum schon mal gesagt, es wird nicht ohne Konflikt gehen. Äh, und das ist sozusagen dann auch eine andere Stufe. Eine erfolgreiche Transition-Bewegung kann eben nicht nur in einer Stadt oder Straße sich die Willigen raussuchen, die sich miteinander verbinden und treffen und dann Dinge tun, sondern in dem Augenblick, wo du eine bestimmte kritische Masse erreichst, zerstörst du das Geschäftsmodell der anderen oder kommst du an so eine Glasdecke internationaler Abkommen, die es anders vorsehen und spätestens dann gibt es echte Konflikte. Oder wenn man sagt, wirklich sagt, ich will, dass das Geld anders ausgegeben wird, dann kommt dir Augenblick des Konflikts. Das sage ich jetzt so, gar nicht um abzuschränken, schrecken, sondern eigentlich zu sagen, genau das muss man wollen. Man muss es systematisch aufbauen an lokalen Orten und irgendwann eine Ebene und Verbindung schaffen, 
die auch diesen Konflikt macht. Also durch die Wand müssen wir durchwollen. Was aber gar kein Problem sind, weil bis dahin sind wir ja ganz viele. Herzlichen Dank. Ja, vielen, vielen Dank, Renate. Ich wünsche dir viel Glück für die nächste Runde. Schieß möglichst viele Tore. Gut. Danke dir. Ciao. Lilly. Sorry for letting you. No, um, Lilly, for I work at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I was reading the chat, so I'm not bringing up my questions, but the ones from those following the chat. And there were quite a few. I'll just pick two. Um, one of question was, how can or can or how can big transnational corporations become part of the transition movement? And yeah, another true. one was, um, what do you say or to Germany or how do you deal with the fact that Germany's success, economic success depends on being a big exporter with a mm, export Weltmeister. So um, what's your response to that? Thank you. Wow, Rob. Okay. My, my ah, name is Tatjana okay. <laughs> and um, for me it was uh, very inspiring to, to see that the transition town is, has a uh, grown to a large movement and my question is that uh, as the energy utilities in the UK have been privatized in the 80s and also the water utilities I would like to know if there's also movement to draw this back so that it's uh, in the hand of um, community organized companies so um, I thought maybe this This can be linked to the transition town movement. Gibt's noch eine? Ja, eine noch und dann brauchen wir wirklich eine Pause, sonst sind wir nachher zu spät mit dem Film. Mein Name ist Robert Strauch und äh, ich bin involviert in einem kleinen Bildungsunternehmen hier in Berlin, was auch bundesweit arbeitet und Permakultur unterrichtet, der Permakulturakademie. Und es ist schade, dass Frau Künast jetzt weg ist, weil ich eigentlich auf Sie äh, antworten wollte, um klarzumachen, äh, bei Permakultur geht es natürlich nicht nur um Kreislaufwirtschaft, sondern um die bewusste Gestaltung des sozialen, ökonomischen und ökologischen zusammen. Es gibt gar keine Trennung davon. Und nur wenn wir so konsequent diese drei Bereiche der Gesellschaft denken, dann kommen wir zu so Lösungen wie Transition Town. Und das andere ist, für mich ist die Transition Town Bewegung ein Ausdruck von einem demokratischen Willen. Und ich glaube, eine große Unterstützung für die Transition Town Bewegung in Europa oder vielleicht weltweit oder erstmal in Europa wäre, wenn wir diese beginnende partizipative Demokratie dadurch unterstützen würden, dass wir mehr Elemente von direkter Demokratie einführen damit solche Initiativen auch in der Lage sind, mit genügend Unterstützung Gesetzesvorhaben einzubringen. Das ist das, was fehlt. Und erst wenn, wenn sich in dem Bereich was verändert, werden Menschen auch wieder politisch aktiv werden, außerhalb der Parteien. Und ich bitte darum, das vielleicht auch Frau Kühners mit auf den Weg zu geben. Danke. Das Letztere kann ich Ihnen auf jeden Fall versprechen. Okay, Rob, your final... Okay. Well, I, I, I remembered a story that I wanted to say in response to a previous question, actually, and the, the question about uh, how do we work with, with government? What would we ask government to do? And I was at an event um, about three months ago, four months ago, where all the... The, the leaders of all the county councils in the, the, my area of England all came together for a two-day kind of thing where they get away from work and they hang out with the other chief executives of the other councils and they learn new ideas and they socialize and they share how things are for them. And, uh, and the guy who runs our local council, who thinks who's very supportive of, of transition, asked us to facilitate it. And at the beginning... Uh, in the go-round, people were asked to say their name and what they hoped to get out of the weekend. And then the kind of throwaway question at the end was, what's your prediction for the economy over the next five or ten years? Now, these are the people who are out there. They're, they are there to deliver the government's growth agenda. They are the people who are out saying, we can make the economy grow. Economic growth is fantastic. In that space, 
when it was uh, what they call Chatham House rules, so what they said wouldn't be attributed to anybody afterwards, one person said, every generation t- until now has had more than the one before it. This is the last generation where that will be the case. One person said, I think that this is what the end of the beginning of the decline of Western civilization looks like. And one person started talking about a history book he was reading about the Romans in Britain in 308 AD when there was straight roads and central heating and agriculture. And 20 years later, it was back in the Iron Age again. And he said, it can happen. It can happen to us. I'm thinking, this is not what you would say in public, obviously. (laughs) But actually, a lot of the time when you get those people on their own, they don't believe it. It's like the emperor's new clothes. It's like the hospital drama where somebody dies and they're trying to electric shock their heart back to life again. And actually what happens is that in this, it's like a madness. And you see it in the uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. It's like a madness. We must make this thing grow. This economy has to grow. Life without growth, is there is no life without growth. Grow. There's no alternative. Grow. Please grow. And, uh, um, And actually it becomes... Yeah, it becomes like a madness. And so, and so what, what's put in order to try and drive that is this idea of you have to remove all the obstacles from big business being able to do what it wants because big business is where growth will come from. So you deregulate. You make it as easy as possible uh, for, for, for business to go where it likes and, and to do what it likes. The problem is that that is often at the expense of resilience at the local level. In Totnes recently, we, we have 41 outlets in the town, independent outlets where you can buy a cup of coffee in a town of 8,500 people. And a big coffee chain decided they wanted to open uh, in the town. And we ran a big campaign to keep them out. And it wasn't a campaign against capitalism. It was a campaign for our local economy, for our local traders, for a story about the thing that is valuable about this town is the fact that we have those coffee shops that are owned by local people and that those are the, those are the people whose kids go to the local school. Those are the people who donate to the local football team. Those are the people who come out uh, and get involved in community events. You know, the, the, the manager of a big coffee chain isn't going to even be interested in that. And astonishingly, the campaign actually won and the coffee chain decided they wouldn't be coming to the town. Uh, and, and, and I think that within that, there's, that, that there's a really interesting story about... Um, about growth, you know, that actually if, if growth is just about sweeping aside those little people so that the real people can play and actually show us how it's done, you know, we, we need to protect those, th- those local economies too. So for me, when it comes to growth, the question is, it's like the emperor's new clothes. You know, who is the person of any gravitas who says, this growth thing is just daft? You know, what, what happened? what's a post-growth economy look like? Um, uh, in terms of the kind of transnational corporations and, and, and the impacts on them, you know, I mean, I, I, I can imagine that, that we maybe get to a stage where, where, where there is, you know, where, where we come into direct conflict. And maybe that example with our coffee shop was one example. But the way that we did that was through through telling this, it wasn't about attacking, we told a story about the kind of world that we wanted to see and we stuck to that story and we told that story again in lots of different ways to lots of different people and people became really kind of valued it. I talked to other traders in the town, they say, do you know what, I'm really proud that we stood up to that actually, I wasn't so sure about it but now everybody's talking about the town that stood up and said they didn't want that to happen and maybe that represented a time when people said we've had enough of these, of the, of these big chains. Um, in terms of Germany as, a, as an export-led economy, I think you know sometimes maybe there's a perception that uh, that I come and I say it's really bad that Germany is an export-led led economy, you know, and I think it's where there's a difference between something like transition and something like degrowth. You know, degrowth will say growth is really bad, growth is is, is immoral, is uh, unecological. In transition, we just say growth is finished. <laughs> now, what do we do? Now what do we do? That's a real positive message, you yeah. think. Well, it's, 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 it's a post-growth economy. What does a post-growth economy look like? It's there to be created. It's an opportunity for all the brilliance that is in this room, that is in your communities, to shape that and tell that story about what that's going to be like. Okay, uh, very quickly. Uh, do we renationalize things? Uh, that would be great, but I don't think that's going to happen uh, right now. But uh, um, mm-hmm, permaculture... Yeah, permaculture is fantastic. Do a permaculture course, it's wonderful.
Oh, and just, and just the, one last yeah. thing I wanted to say, that we have a, the, 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 the In Transition 2, which is the film that we made, which is a really good grounding In Transition, tells many of the stories in more depth that you heard here uh, are for sale outside the door, if you would like one of those. Okay, he's a salesman. Okay. Uh, Locally produced. Once again, Rob, I really want to thank you. I appreciate very much so on behalf of the foundation what you did tonight. It was excellent, inspiring, encouraging, empowering. Thank you. Ich hoffe, Sie fühlen sich auch ermutigt. Und nochmal, es gibt jetzt fünf, 15 Minuten Pause, weil irgendwas umgebaut werden muss. Sie kriegen was zu trinken und brezeln, sie kommen erfrischt zurück und dann geht es weiter mit der Inspiration durch den Film. Und wie gesagt, nochmal, Herr Aguilar ist ja auch nachher da. Wir, sie können noch weiter diskutieren und bis gleich. <lacht>